You're listening to Gender, A Wider Lens. I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Since 2016, my practice has been exclusively dedicated to gender questioning teens and families impacted by gender dysphoria. I also work with gender questioning teenagers and I facilitate at support meetings for families and individuals who have been impacted by gender issues. We're curious about the concept of gender and how it's unfolding in the wider culture. Join us as we look at gender through a wider lens. Stephanie Davies Arai is the founder and director of Transgender Trend, the leading UK organization calling for evidence based healthcare for gender dysphoric children and young people and for fact based teaching in schools. She was shortlisted for the John Maddox Prize in 2018 for her school's guide called Supporting Gender Diverse and Trans Identified Students in Schools. She's a communication skills expert, a teacher trainer, a parent coach, and she's the author of a book called Communicating with Kids. Stephanie was also an intervener in the High Court in support of Kiara Bell and Mrs. A, who brought a landmark case against the Tavistock Gender Identity Development Service. Their claim was that under-18s are not old enough to consent to treatment with puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. Stephanie was awarded the British Empire Medal as founder of Transgender Trend for their services to children in the Queen's Jubilee Birthday Honours List. So in our discussion, here's what we talk about. Adults have always attempted to strike a balance between encouraging creativity and affirming reality for children. Stephanie started noticing a reversal in the parent-child relationship when she was researching parenting books, and then she saw this reversal come to life in media stories of trans children and the parents whose job it was, supposedly, to simply facilitate their child's self-development. We also asked Stephanie, with her background as an expert in communication with kids, How would she want to introduce ideas like sex, gender, sexual orientation, feminism, and media literacy to kids? We also explore how other kinds of vulnerable groups and protected categories become outshadowed when we fixate disproportionately on gender and sexuality. How does that fixation impact children's development and their sense of self? And what happens when we lie to children? Stephanie offers some advice to parents who hope that their child's fixation in one particular thing or another will resolve, whether that is gender or otherwise. And lastly, we ask Stephanie to make some predictions about what will transpire regarding gender, transition, and education in the near future. I wanted to take a minute before we jump in and make a quick correction. You'll hear me saying later on that Transgender Trend was the only organization and the most important organization for parents at the time who were concerned about their kids' gender questioning. But I forgot to say in the UK, because as Stephanie later points out, Fourth Wave Now was already in existence in the US at the time that Transgender Trend launched. And of course, in the mid-2010s, both of these organizations were really a lone voice Um, for parents who were looking for alternative explanations of why their kids were suddenly questioning their gender. So I just wanted to make that clarification. And with that out of the way, here's our conversation with Stephanie. The very brave, the very important Stephanie Davies R.I., thank you for joining us on the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. (laughs) We're delighted to have you, I I, I suppose, because I'm, I'm kind of Ireland, UK, you were the name that when I first heard about gender, was, continuously that was the name that everybody circled back on Stephanie Davis or I, Stephanie Davis or I. Have you seen what Stephanie Davis or I says about it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> And it, it, it's kind of extraordinary when you look at how early you were the canary in the coal mine and how much you were kind of saying, hey, 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 have a look at this. There's something going on. Do you, do you want to bring us back to that? Or was it something previous to that that kind of led into it, I wonder? Well, you know, it, it was a, at least a year when I was getting really um, concerned about what, what I was reading in the press. And actually, I, I didn't come to it through looking at teenage girls, which is a, you know, a huge concern. It, it was little children because most of the newspaper reports were of um, you know, primary age, really young children being transitioned in schools. And I never went through the kind of, oh, you know, this is nice, this is accepting stage at all. I was immediately horrified. It was immediate red, red flags. And, and I came to it through 
my work with parents and teachers and and children. I mean, I, I worked in a primary school for eight years. Um, so it was, you know, from the point of view of safeguarding, um, from the, and also, you know, I teach communication skills and I, and I worked for, you know, I'd worked for a couple, over a couple of decades with parents, sometimes one to one, sometimes running courses or workshops. And I, uh, designed my own course and wrote my book, Communicating with Kids. And all of that was about how we, what we say to kids and what they understand from what we say. Um, according to their developmental stage. And so immediately I heard, you know, little boys were being told by parents and teachers, you know, being affirmed as girls. Um, that was, sorry, that, you know, you don't do that to a child. You don't, you don't tell a lie to a child in that way. Um, you, you know, as parents, we affirm, we're constantly affirming reality to our children. You know, our children will say, mummy, there's a cat. And we'll say, yes, it's a cat. Or if it's not, we'll say, no, that's a doggy. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we will correct our uh, children and, and, uh, and so that they understand reality. And on the other hand, we will also um, say, yes, you're a beautiful princess or, oh, you're Superman when they dress up and they pretend because that encourages imagination, but that's very short term. And we, t- we sort of, you know, we participate in that game where everyone pretends it's reality for a while. Um, but generally in life, we are always, always affirming the reality that our child is seeing because we know that that is our child's development towards reality and being, being able to distinguish between fantasy and reality. And we do it unconsciously, don't we, as parents? We're not thinking, oh, this is a teaching Um, moment. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And you were a kid like me. You wanted to be a boy and you were the the roughest and the toughest. (laughs) I didn't just want to be a boy, Stella. I was a boy. (laughs) Fiercely, I was a boy. I had... I had contempt for tomboys, you know, because they yeah, weren't me real boys. I, I thought they were girls. <laughs> okay. okay, it's not a competition. Okay, but you know, yes, I was that. <laughs> also, I was that child, and um, and and then went through all the awful um, stages of puberty and adolescence, where I had the eating disorders, and uh, it was it was yeah, incredibly distressing uh, as my body betrayed me, and I no longer had that gender neutral body. Um, and and I was um, becoming the shape of a woman. I so embarrassing, so humiliating, uh, and, and 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 my body was out of control. There was nothing I could do to stop it developing. Um, so I went through that very really, you know. And and so I have absolute empathy for girls who are uh, wanting to transition. Absolutely, total. Um, Sympathy and empathy and understanding with that feeling, and you know, really, you know, we, I think there are quite a lot of older women like us, um, and and we look back and think, oh, if, if I was a child now, I'd be taking puberty blockers. And I, it's very difficult to say, but I think because my personality was so um, um, uh, rebellious, um, I couldn't care less about consequences. Uh, I did what I wanted to do. I was the roughest and toughest and bravest. And because of that personality, I think I would have been very drawn to taking um, puberty blocks and I, and, and, and I wouldn't have cared less about the consequences. But, uh, you know, you can't say, but I, I certainly think I, mm-hmm. I, I would have mm-hmm. been very tempted. You know, the thought of someone saying, actually, you are a boy... Yeah, powerful. Yeah, um, just to confirm it. Mm-hmm. I remember um, for myself, like the, pu- the process of puberty, which was long and awful, but was the kind of thing that pulled mm. me out. Now, I know it doesn't pull everybody out. Do, do you think that's what happened to you or was it more longer drawn out? Or I'm always very unsure about the timescales of all this sort of stuff. I think it takes years to unpick uh what goes on for you at puberty and adolescence really really years to unpick all the influences and because I think it was there was a lot of internalized misogyny from on my part that I didn't recognize um I did believe that women were weaker and stupid and 
uh, and I grew up, grew up in the era in the seventies when women were represented as, as bimbos, brainless bimbos, scantily clad brainless bimbos on TV programs that were family viewing. So we'd sit around as a family and we'd watch. You know, there were lecherous old men leching over young women. Um, the wives were always old battle axes who the husbands hated. And um, so that was mm-hmm. really prevalent um, and that was normal. Um, so I think I I really did have, uh, you know, I'm different to that. I'm not that. I'm not a woman because I'm yeah. not that. Um, and... So I didn't realise that at, at the time. You know, I thought I was really self-aware. I thought I was more self-aware than most people. And, um, I, you know, it, I think it took me decades probably to really unpick all, all of that. Um, but, yes, I, I, I know, but also I think I was kind of saved from the absolute brink in that era with punk because punk allowed you to really dress how you wanted to be wild to where I mean I spent when I was at art college and I spent my time in in um army I, I bought my clothes from the army surplus stores and wore sort of fatigues and <laughs> army gear and I could do that because punk allowed you to do anything and and you know some girls would wear mini skirts and 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 ripped fishnet stockings but you didn't have to you, you in fact the any girl that tried to be sort of conventionally pretty w- was kind of, you know, n- not taken seriously. You had to be wild. So you could wear makeup as long as it was really black and really sort of extreme. And you you coloured your hair and put it in wild styles and Mohicans, etc. So there's huge freedom to, to actually um, be something that was um, unconventional and, and and that went across both sexes, you know, boys and girls could do that. So I think that that really sort of saved me from real, um, well, you know, it, it helped. And I I don't think children have, I don't yeah. think young people have that now. That sort of safety valve or. So it, it took you a long time to unpick your experiences of puberty, but what didn't fade away was that sense of, gutsiness and bravery and I'm thinking about before we started this call you and I were just thinking back we've known each other kind of informally online since I know for me since about 2015 I think and we've never sat face to face and met and when when we were talking earlier about this kind of sense of not thinking about consequences I have to say when I started working in this field I was exactly in that place where I said, well, this just doesn't make sense. I'm just going to get out there and be a normal therapist. And what could what could happen? Like, I had no idea (laughs) what was going to happen and how controversial it would be. But can talk to us about the early days of, you know, you recognized right away when other people couldn't see it, you recognized something was unhealthy about telling children they're in the wrong body or that they're a different sex. And then how did you go from that to starting Transgender Trend, which is by far the most important organization that was in existence at the time and still continues to be. I mean, how how did you make that leap from I see something is wrong to I actually want to make this my my life's work? I, well, yeah, that was that sort of happened accidentally. I didn't know it would become my life's work. Um, so yeah, we were talking earlier and about the qualities that you know one of them was sort of stupidity um uh naivety um <laughs> uh, but also that it's something I've always done I've always jumped in feet first um and I've always done the scary thing and it seems to be a compulsion of mine to uh, um it, it's almost like bring it on I I will you know and, and it's part of being a boy when I was younger I still retain that quality of when I was a child, I would dive off the highest diving board. I was absolutely terrified, but I was the bravest, so I had to do it. And and and, I, and sometimes I think I'm I'm still trying to prove to myself that I'm the bravest. You know, I retain that. Um, mm. So I think, um, but but also I think when you do, so, I think there's a, a sort of compulsion to do. Um, 
it, you know, if I see an injustice, I I can't sit back. And it, and when I first saw, I mean, so I start. It started by seeing uh, newspaper articles about the youngest children being transitioned in schools. So I didn't come into this through sort of teenage girls. It was little children actually, mm-hmm. and and that was immediate red red flag. Immediate red flag. And I thought, why would why is it not for everybody else? Um, because it's it, it was you know I'd worked with parents and teachers for over a couple of decades before starting transgender trend. I'd worked in a primary school for eight years. Um, you know, safeguarding training. I. Um, I'd worked with parents one to one. I designed my own course called Communicating with Kids and wrote a book. So all my book was about, and, and my work was about how we communicate with children, what we say to them, and what they understand from what we say, because we often talk to children in ways that confuse them, and we, you know, we're not getting the message across that we think we are, That's- and that causes problems. So it's really simple, basic stuff, really. So as soon as I heard, you know, you've got parents and teachers here saying to a boy, "Yes, you're a girl." Well, that is crazy. You know, you 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 don't do that. You don't tell lies to children. You you just been teaching communication, so it was like you you are an expert in exactly this is exactly what you don't do. So you, I presume you were like, hang on, mm. everybody, you've all got it wrong here. I, I'll just inform you, and you will know better. Was it something like that at the time? Mm. It, it was it was sort of why isn't anybody else saying anything because I worked in a very um you know if I have expertise it's really in parenting advice I don't like parenting advice books but my book doesn't have parenting in the title um that's deliberate communicating with kids what we say what they understand and sometimes that's a very different thing we expect them to understand what we're saying and they understand the opposite because of how we word it and how we say it. So um, I was very much in that world of parenting advice and I did a lot of research on parenting advice books before I wrote my own and found that and there were thousands of that, hundreds of thousands of parenting books. And I found that they, they were sort of split into two camps, the authoritarian, which was the sort of back to good old fashioned discipline, and the child centered and child centered was in the ascendancy and has been for perhaps a couple of decades and this was very much um to do with following the child the child is is wise and we learn from the child's wisdom and the child is born with a fully formed sense of self and is a fully formed person and our job is to facilitate the expression of that self as adults so you can see where the adult child relationship becomes reversed and you can see that in the I mean this is where I think the because I, I, I was thinking you know how, how come this idea that boys are literally girls and girls are literally boys come from and why has it been accepted with no question by adults who are in position of, you know, the parents or teachers or adults in position of responsibility, adults that work with children. And I think there was already a fertile soil for that idea to grow. He knows who he is. You know, that's that's what we hear. Mm-hmm. He knows who he is. Um, and so that, you know, the sort of understanding. Oh, but my feeling was like why is nobody saying anything why is nobody seeing what I see here because they should do you know within that parenting advice world within the parenting blogs and um uh, and and the the, of course the feminism board on mum's letters exempt from this criticism but but then you know other parenting blogs when you know and and and, uh, child charities or websites I looked everywhere for any questioning of this sudden appearance of the transgender child, mm-hmm. and nothing. And having mm-hmm. worked, I mean, particularly from working in the primary school for eight years, I know that every fad that comes in is questioned. Um, strong disagreement is allowed. You know, things like brain gym, and uh, there were all sorts of things that came <laughs> came and went when I was working in in the primary school, and. Um, you know, they're sort of welcomed in and then found not to work and discarded. But there was a lot of 
discussion about it. And this was the one area that nobody was saying anything. So that really... Um, what year was this, Stephanie? Well, I think around 2013, 2014 was when I really started okay. to see a real spread of, uh, or, you know, increase in those kind of articles in the press. Yes. And at that time, were you looking also towards the U.S. for voices that were saying similar things? Like I'm trying to figure out when a blog like Fourth Wave Now, for example, came in, into existence, because it seems like you guys popped up around the same time. Fourth Wave Now came in early 2015. And Transgender Trend, the, the website, finally published it in November of 2015. So Fourth Wave Now was the pioneer. Um, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Brilliant writing, brilliant analysis. So she, yes. you know, Denise was yes. the first, and she contacted me when mm-hmm. it was in March, I think. Two that was that two must have been two thousand and fifteen. Um, and I wrote a parenting blog, a weekly parenting blog, which was fairly light-hearted. Some, some, I, I would touch on feminism. I would touch on. Um, sort of more serious things and, and, and sometimes I'd write something that was just funny um, or made me laugh and um, I found myself really really wanting to write about this subject because nobody else was and I put out my first parenting blog called Is My Child Transgender and what triggered that was an article in the Huffington Post and um, about a trans child or uh, and I, I, it was just like a tipping point for me one more piece about a you know brave trans child and Mm -hmm. brave parents supporting him and so I wrote this piece and I remember remember how scared I was of publishing it and putting it on parenting blogs like Brit Mums uh and uh you know when I hit publish I was really scared because I thought this is an area and you, you know I'd got the message very very clearly by then this is an area not allowed to talk about and uh, I knew it was political, and so I, you know, I thought, oh, for my blog, is it too heavy? Will I lose followers? Um, uh, it was really scary. And, and it really, if you mm-hmm. look back at that time, and Sasha, you'll probably remember it. Really, there was nobody. I mean, I know there were there, there were some feminists in the UK. I think Glosswich, Sarah Dighton, but there there were various feminists who were. I was seeing stories that they would be commissioned to write articles, and then that's you know then then they were rejected on on the, on sort of on this issue. So I knew that there were feminists, and I also knew um, a group of lesbians: um, Julia Long, Sheila Jeffries, um, um, Angela Wilde, who I'd met with, um, and I think that was in 2015 uh, after the Philia feminist conference in London um, and I knew they were really supportive and we got together in an email group and it was great to know that this and I know that you know people like Sheila Jeffries have been speaking out um, years ago and, and, and feminists like Judy Bindle uh, so but I wasn't really aware of it and I wasn't it hadn't come to the it hadn't come to children you know there, there, there were mm-hmm. The whole issue of, of transitioning children hadn't really come up, um, or I if it if it had, I wasn't aware of it until around 2013, I think. So what happened when yeah. you hit published on, on your blog? What what happened next? It was you, a cliffhanger. You kind of went into this just. I'm going to say the truth, and then what? <laughs> um, yeah, the the world didn't fall in. Um, I got lots of uh, responses from parents uh, expressing their relief yeah. that finally somebody had written about this. Um, and that's when Denise of Fourth Wave Now contacted me. And she, you know, I, I, like at that time, was amazed to see so- that somebody else had written about this subject. So she grabbed mm-hmm. hold of me. And for a mm-hmm. while, we, we were, you know, we got together with a group of um parents who's mostly uh, teenagers, mostly mostly teenage girls, Um who, who had suddenly decided they were trans, and um, um, we had an email group, and we were we were thinking, you know, I, I, at that time I was thinking, 
I have to say, I have to make a separate website because this had become all I wanted to write about. And I recognised with the reaction of parents to that blog that there was a real need for parents to have an online resource that was clear information, research and evidence and facts, rather than the ideology they were finding when they searched online and found groups like in here in the UK, it's mermaids and gendered intelligence and um, all, all of the trans groups who were just saying, you know, if your boy says I'm a girl, affirm him as a girl. And that's not damaging. That's, you know, just accepting her for who she is. Um, so I, I, I felt and I thought, I think I thought at the time, I was set up with separate websites so I can write about this subject because I can't keep writing. I think I wrote three blogs in the end for my Communicating with Kids blog. Um, and I, I thought, so I'll have a separate website and it'll be kind of part of my work with Communicating with Kids and I'll do Transgender Trend. And I did, I think, um, one. I wanted that to be a resource for parents um, but I think I also wanted to be a voice in the press. I wanted people, uh, the press, to contact me for comment because there were there were no questioning voices in the in the articles in in the newspapers, and um, and I I knew that I had to be an organisation because nobody knew who I was, so I had to be an organisation, and I put out a press release when we first launched to let everyone know who we were, and and that happened very quickly. We contacted would contact me for comments and and that started that happening and I don't really know at the time how I imagined that transgender trend would be a quiet little resource for parents to access at the same time as me being in the media um and <laughs> and you know getting that sort of notoriety uh of the the organization that was challenging this so I I I, I think I was a little bit naive but kind of new, you know, sort of, um, yeah. How much was I aware of the... Um... I know, I wonder, I wonder. And how how soon were you kind of thinking it was much bigger than that? that how soon were you like thinking, oh my God, this is exploding? Or was it was it slow, a slow build, if you follow me? I, I think it exploded, actually. Um, it... It sort of by the time I'd got the website published, it had already exploded in the UK. That was the year that there was the huge increase in referrals to the Tavistock. And what happened um, late 2014? The BBC put out a program for kids about called "I Am Leo" about a transitioning girl, uh, which which was aimed at six to 12 year olds. So I had Polly Carmichael from the Tavistock Clinic saying puberty blockers were just a pause button. And if you stop them, your puberty would resume as normal. And so the whole, and it was all based on stereotypes. It was a appalling, appalling program. That was late 2014. And then in 2015, the time that I knew it had become, it really exploded into the mainstream was a program um, uh, a documentary by Louis Theroux, and that's a hugely popular documentary in the in series in the UK. And Louis Theroux had uh, done an episode called Transgender Kids. And this is one of the issues that, for me, that the program wasn't called Children with Gender Dysphoria, it was called Transgender Kids. And as soon as that came on, so that was April 2015, I knew that that was it. Absolute mainstream, it would explode. And that was the year. And the Tavistock Clinic um, gathered their stats, the referral numbers, from April to April. And Louis Theroux was broadcast on primetime TV, very popular program in April of that year. So that April to April of that year was the huge rise. Um, so that was that was already happening, and I, 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 you know, as I was working on 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 building the website, there was very little though. If you look at the website now, 
It's a historical document. It's like the detransition page. I can't keep up. There's far too much now material. I try, you know, I try to keep it updated, but it's it's really impossible. If you look, if you scroll right down to the bottom of that page, you will see, I'm talking about the US, you will see writings from Maria Cat and groups like this Soft Space, mm-hmm. Third Way Trans, and it was really looking, it was all, you know, so there were already detransitioner support groups and detransitioners writing, but they were all from the US. And I looked at the US and thought, well, you're about five years ahead of the, of us. This is going to happen in the UK in about five years' time. And I think it's happened quicker than this, actually. I, I always tell parents who are kind of new, let's say they've only discovered recently that their child is questioning their gender. I often tell them, I know this is terrifying, but when I first started, there were like five detransitioners that I knew of. And now it's like you're saying, Stephanie, we cannot even keep up with the number of people who are kind mm. of sharing their experiences here. So I think it's it's the landscape is changing so quickly and all the time. It's so hard to keep up. I, I want to ask a question about the the kind of teenage onset gender distress, because you could easily understand the young kids, A, because you had a background in uh, parenting and communicating with children and young children and developmental psychology, those kinds of things, and you had your own experience with gender. But then when you started to hear stories from parents about their teenage daughters suddenly announcing trans how did you start to piece together what's going on there? Because that does feel quite different to me than the young kids who are declaring a different gender in kind of the innocence of childhood. How did you figure out what's going on with the teens? Well, I can understand it through, um, I, I don't think the experiences that teenage girls are having now are dis- that dissimilar to mine it's sort of my body is betraying me I have no control I can't do you know I can't make uh, and, and suddenly your body is public property as a, as a girl um I, 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 the, the experience of puberty and ad- adolescence um I think has it's you you know is, is unique it's very different to the experience of boys um, who also have you know issues and problems, and it's no easy road for anybody really. I think, but for girls, the issues are so much bigger because suddenly you move from being a, a human being into an object because everybody has a right to comment on your body, to even touch it, even abuse it. Um, and looking back at the culture I grew up in, was which was you know sexist. Um, now, when I look at the culture now, where I think when I was growing up, women were objectified. And what that has led to is inevitably, if you objectify, you dehumanise. And once you dehumanise a group, you can abuse them. And that's what ha- what's happened through porn, that, that, that kids are seeing the most abusive and degrading and humiliating and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, porn on smartphones. And the culture that girls are growing up in now, I can't imagine. I cannot imagine how girls deal with that. Um, Plus, there is the selfie culture, the online social media culture, the Instagram culture, where you have to be groomed within an inch of your life just to be able to leave the front door, you know, to to, to be acceptable. And when I was growing up, I think... you know, I think some of us shaved our legs sometimes. I think we tried a bit of plum eyeshadow, um, you know, but we were, you know, we, back in those days, we didn't have to have false fingernails or false eyelashes or wear foundation. You know, the, when you see young girls now, they're so highly groomed just to be acceptable. So all of those pressures on girls and pressures on boys have increased as well. There's more objectification of men. There's programs like Love Island where men have to have six packs. And if you look at the online, like gaming, uh, you know, all all of the sort of six pack muscly superheroes and all of the heroines have plunging cleavages and tiny waists. And so those sorts of stereotypes um, are uh, really um, exaggerated and pushed on children. It's real sort of body fascism, isn't it? Real, you know, impossible 
so-called ideals to live up to. We hope you're enjoying this episode of our podcast. We work very hard to maintain high quality content for this show, and we're grateful to Rhyme and Genspect for supporting us. Rhyme, or Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics, is a non-profit organization dedicated to improving long-term care for gender-variant individuals. Visit rethinkime.org to learn more. And Genspect is an international alliance of parents and professional groups whose aim is to advocate for parents of gender-questioning children and young people. If you'd like to become a patron, you'll have access to weekly transcripts and special Q&As, and you can join our listener community. Now back to the show. I, I want to I kind of ask you about a, a perspective that I think about here. I think that there's a place where that's true in certain types of media imagery, but I'm also aware that young people today are so much more conscious, for example, of body positivity and that you can be you know, great at any size, and that a woman's worth is not based in her appearance. Like there are really contradictory messages, I guess, is what we're saying, because you're absolutely right about the the types of uh, hyper feminine and hyper masculine imagery. And on the other hand, I think kids know uh, consciously that that's not okay. And I, I don't think it's quite as as polarized as sometimes we make it out to be. I don't know if you agree with that, but like teenagers I work with are very conscious of sexual harassment or guys being creeps and not objectifying women. Like they're thinking about that a lot more than I was when I was young. I was just intimidated by that kind of sexual aggression from men. But I think kids today know that that's not okay. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think, you know, there isn't a sort of blanket um, or kids are being um, uh, sort of indoctrinated and will be uh, you know, going along with this. There's a lot of kids who are questioning and um, and, and, and and encouraged to, to question and critique these things. But I think what you're looking at and what we're seeing is it's the most vulnerable kids. So it's the neurodiverse, the children from care. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, the um, children who, who felt bullied and left out and not part of um, the same-sex peer group and, um, and perhaps have been bullied or have, you know, the sort of mental health issues that tend to emerge during adolescence. Um, so mm-hmm. I think, you know, the same as, as with everything, it is, it, it's generally it's the most vulnerable children that are affected and other kids uh, are not. You know, I hear a, a lot of you know, parents will say, my kids are absolutely sick of this being, you know, the word gender and they know it's all a load of rubbish or, you know, it's, so it's not a blanket sort of every, every child is um, is the same. But I do think it's the most vulnerable kids who get sort of pulled into it for various reasons. And sometimes I've noticed it's the kids who are actively starting to question those norms that kind of fall down a slippery slope of break the gender binary and sex isn't real. Like there is a kind of very, um, a lot of kids that I work with, for example, they started out as very strong feminists and they were really into kind of women's empowerment and they were thinking about social justice issues, but then it takes this bizarre twist into the trans activism and the kind of radical gender ideology which ends up, of course, contradicting a lot of the women's empowerment motivations that were there in the first place. I think it's, um, but you know, one thing I think is that um, feminism is not really taught in schools. They may have lessons about the suffragettes, but the kind of feminism or so-called feminism that girls are uh, brought up with, and this is across all the universities, is not really feminism. It's part of identity politics. Um, and so you've got empowerment. It's empowering to um, work in the sex industry. It's empowering. That, that It began to be a word I, I hate. Um, and that it's all about choice, individual choice. If you're choosing something and consenting to it, it's empowering. And in fact, that, that avoids the issue of the pressure on girls. But if you don't choose that, if you don't consent to that, you're a prude or you're um, you know the pressures of society, the pressures of from boys, um, and and the the fact that girls feel that 
they must consent or they, you know, they've got no choice and they must look, you know, actually they have no choice. Yeah. Or they won't be empowered. Yeah. Right? Like that's how you be empowered. Quote yeah. unquote. That's and right. A kind of, and there also there's, a, it's a kind of individualized oppression Olympics as well. I think that, you know, we're fat shaming what, you know, your privilege and, and that whole, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's all identity politics, and it's not a real um, a kind. You know, I mean, I don't um, don't particularly like the term radical feminism because I, I, you know, I, I feel that feminism is something different to the kind of what's called liberal feminism or third wave feminism that's throughout all the universities and and on you know what girls learn. So there's a lot of it online. Um, and I don't think it is um, empowering feminism at all for girls. I think it's, it, you know, it's the, um, there's no critique of the sex industry and the exploitation or, you know, for financial gain of women's bodies and the objectification and the commercialization of women as products. There's no um, analysis of that at all. It's just if you choose to do it, it's empowering for you. Um, and I think that's... Um, uh, you know that lets girls down. It's it looks good. My choice, my body, my choice. You know this, um, but 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 actually we need it. We need a greater you know analysis than that. You know we need to be critiquing uh, institutions that make money from women. Uh, Stephanie, if you had a, a like a magic wand with your communications background, what would you be teaching? Girls, boys, teenagers, like all the way up, how would you bring in, let's say, sexual orientation? How would you bring in gender roles? How would you bring in feminism? <laughs> I know I've just lashed that on you, but <laughs> if if you could. What's your what's your 15 point plan, well, here, yeah, Stephanie? Yeah. Well, <laughs> the first thing I think is that um I that, that being able to define um the word sex and gender. And actually have a look at what those words mean um, and, you know, uh, and what they, um, how they operate, um, how how gender operates in relation to sex and how we can understand that and make decisions in our own lives too. And there is, you know, there are some things, like one thing I learned from um, my research and writing my book is, I read an awful lot about um, nature versus nurture. And, you know, but basically everything in the end comes down to, well, it's sort of half a dozen, one, six of the other. It, it's it's really, you know, it's a mixture of both. You can't take away. So I don't subscribe to the idea that um, women are like we are only because of socialisation. I think there are differences between the sexes that we... Uh, um, it, it's misleading if we don't acknowledge the differences between the sexes, um, but but also recognise the role of, of how socialisation tends to exacerbate and, and reinforce stereotypes. So I think that sort of basic understanding of um, of our biology and then how ideas of gender impact on that. Is, is is the foundation I think of of you know, actually sort of empowering young people to understand themselves, understand more of society, and um, be able to because I think if you are able to critique the messages you're getting, because part of what I do in communication is is not just verbal messages but visual messages, the wallpaper of our lives as we go into the supermarket or the news agent or what we see on tv um and how visual messages go in at a very sort of deeper level primitive brain level and have a huge influence without us realizing it so um and but but if we can be aware of that and be able to uh, critique all the messages we get from our culture then we can make truly sort of free decisions um, and and form our opinions. If we're not aware of the messages we're receiving, we'll be a slave to them. You know, we'll, we'll, we will be making decisions or going along in our lives without really fully 
um, be, being able to be in, in sort of control of how we respond to those messages. So I always think teach children to critique the messages they're receiving, whether they're verbal messages or, or visual messages or direct messages or indirect messages. There was one thing just you and Sasha were circling on earlier, and I was wondering, was it maybe an excessive focus on things might be bringing out the worst in us just because we as humans can tend to zone, especially during teenage years, we can zone in and become a little bit obsessive about things. So I was wondering, is it, is it something, the girl, you know, the girl that Sasha described who was at first a fem- feminist warrior, and I know what you're saying, Steph- Stephanie, because you're saying, well, they weren't really, they're were kind of learning a certain type of feminism. And then they go kind of, you know, on some level, they change to wanting to be a boy and move right out of it. I wonder, is there an excessive focus on sex and on who they are and on on what they look like and how they fit? And in a way, is is clubs like, let's say, the LGBT clubs in schools, is that bringing in an excessive focus. I often wonder that about those clubs. And would they be better off thinking about even the environment or chess or other things? I think when, um, yes, there's there's a huge emphasis now on LGBTQ plus everything. And, you know, in schools, it's like they're the only vulnerable group. So where, where, are the, where are the clubs for autistic children? Where are the clubs for disabled children? Where are the clubs for traveller children or any other vulnerable group or protected category? No, it's always LGBTQ+. And I think what those groups do is they the, the older children lead the young. So the older children will be encouraging the younger children to explore their gender identities. And, and, and you, you, you know... You, you precipitate all of that, um, and they will be affirmed. If any child says, "I, I," you know, if a girl says, "I, I'm a boy," they'll be affirmed as a boy, and they'll be, you know, by the older kids. And the younger kids, of course, will look up to the older kids and 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 want to be like them. So I think they're really um, they shouldn't exist in schools. And also, there are so many of these clubs in every area in the UK outside schools that offer, you know. Um, school and 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 in, you know i don't know the, all sorts of activities they you know really um attractive for young people to go to but you can only go if you're questioning your gender identity or, or if you identify as lgbtq plus and again there aren't these youth clubs put on for other vulnerable groups and it's become the only way to be non-conforming to show the world that you're non-conforming to have some uh, sexual or gender identity and um, it's the only way to be a rebel and to show that you're not conventional. Um, and again, there, there used to be lots of ways to do that that were quite safe. And we, and we recognise that, the need to pass through those. It's a time of life where children are developing their identities. It's their job. It's their main job um, as they move from childhood to adulthood. So they, um, the first step of that job is to find the tribe, to follow the rules, to follow the dress code, etc., to know who your enemies are. Um, and it's the stage where parents get really worried and say, oh, I'm far too influenced by their peers. But actually, that's completely normal. You establish your identity within the tribe, and only then when you feel secure, you need a secure space. You're moving away from your parents, and only then can you go through the process of individuation and, and find your um, individual identity and start questioning um, but you need the security of the group first. And and, so, and most of those groups, so goths, punks, emos, whatever, um, were, 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 an, a, were a safe way to be non-conforming and show the world that you were non-conforming. Um, and then you'd move through it. And, and very few people in their late 20s are still goths or emos and still dressing in that way. And they, it's a stage that you move through. But with trans, of course, we know... It's not a safe way because, you know, that there's the um, in, increased likelihood that you will go onto a medical pathway if you're affirmed um, in your gender identity, and um, so it's not a it's not a way that schools should be encouraging 
um, and helping a child along that pathway. School should be a space. In fact, school's job is to hold the space, is what I think, that hold the space for children to grow and develop and not give them, um, uh, not unduly influence them in one way or the other. In fact, you know, actually take the focus away from gender. <laughs> Don't keep reinforcing it with your pride celebrations and your, you know, your your trans assemblies and your... Don't... You know, in any other area, when, as you say, children and ad adolescents tend to get obsessed with one thing, and particularly social justice issues, as this is, is, is seen... Um, but I'm thinking of the sort of social contagion amongst teenage girls, that the advice always is to, you know, not minimise it and dismiss it, but actually take the focus away from it. And that's what always, always is the best parenting advice. It, whatever issue it is with your child, whether it's only eating bread and jam and refusing to eat anything else, this, these issues quite often come up around food or having, uh, you know, being obsessed with one thing and refusing to do anything else, the more attention you give that behaviour, and whether that is negative attention or positive attention, the more that behaviour will become ingrained because the thing the child might wants most is the parent's attention. So the little boy who says he's a girl, the parent who gets really out, and this is quite common, um, because, and particularly from homophobic parents who think, you know, he's going to grow up to be gay, so we'll you know, knock that out of him right from the start. So the dad who makes him do macho things and uh, he gets shouted at, he gets smacked, he gets his, you know, um, if he's playing with dolls, he gets them taken away. All of this goes on and that's really negative attention. The opposite, the other side of the coin is the positive attention of, yes, you're a girl, how brave, we'll get everybody to call you a girl and we'll get, you know, we'll, school will put on a sem for you uh, we'll even get you on the TV or on the front of a magazine. You know, uh, so much positive attention. And it does exactly the same thing. It it, it reinforces and, and solidifies that behaviour. Um, with any other issue, you know, these kinds of issues with, 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 with children, I'd always say to parents, don't give attention to the thing that you don't want to continue or you don't want it to become a big deal. You don't want the child to be, you know, just leave it. Let it, um, you know, don't don't um, don't be too interested. <laughs> don't be too interested in the behaviour. And and uh, um, not that I think there's anything wrong with a boy playing with dolls, but if you want that boy to become more and more, you know, definite, I'm a girl, I'm a girl, then give it all of your attention. If you want that boy to be able to sort of quite happily play with dolls and 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 not sort of go too far down that route, then you might want to go into the school and say, look, don't make a big deal of this. Just let him do it and make sure he's not bullied. Mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. it, it just reminds me of this solid advice that we've heard over and over in Transgender Trend and, and Fourth Wave now and other places. We don't want to foreclose anything. So mm -hmm. either direction creates like this narrow pathway where child and parent is both really obsessed with this one issue. So I hear you say this and I think, yes, we just want to leave the path open for various directions it might take. Um, I, I do want to speak with you before we go about something really important. You were awarded the British Empire Medal recently and I, I, as an American, and I'm sure many of our listeners would, would love to hear more about this and also just help us understand the context. And I'll tell you why that feels important to me. I could not imagine in, in America, our government, for example, giving an award to somebody like Denise from Fourth Wave now at this point. You know, we're not there. So I don't know we what it means there. exactly, but the way <laughs> I read that, I thought... That's incredible that Stephanie is being honored as you should. Yeah. Which to me seems to indicate that that you know Britain is in a good place understanding the value of your work in children's lives. So just brag about yourself a little bit here, <laughs> Stephanie. Can you say well, more? Um, well, one I would never have imagined in my life ever getting an 
a, a, an honour from the Queen ever. Um, <laughs> you, you know, in my, I, I think my parents would never have imagined that of their three children, I would be the one who got this. Um, um, how, how did it come in? Do they write to you or, or do they phone you or do they write to you? I got an email. Have, actually, oh, really? Yeah, I just got an email. And I, I had to respond to it very quickly, actually. It was only sort of the next day or something they wanted, you know, will you accept it or not? Um, Yikes. So that was, I think, from, from, from the Home Office, I think. Um, so that it was like, um, uh, yeah, I uh, what? <laughs> um, uh, and 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 yes, it was. What was so thrilling, and then I couldn't tell anyone. I think that w- that would be treason or something. You know, I, I wasn't allowed to say anything to anyone. So I knew for about a month, and uh, I, yeah, it was really difficult. I mean, I think in some ways I'm still processing it because. What what really thrilled me was the fact that it was, um, you know, the full sort of official thing was Stephanie Oserai, founder of Transgender Trend for Services to Children. And it was that for services to children as founder of Transgender Trend. Couldn't be plainer. Wow. And so Beautiful. I think... Um, 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 yeah, it was it was amazing, and um, um, I, and what really thrills me is that one. I think it do, it has to indicate a sea change. I couldn't ima- ever imagine this. Ha- I mean, a year ago, could this have happened? I can't. I, you know, I mean, certainly. Three years ago, it, 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 it couldn't have happened. I mean, I've been on this journey that has taken me from um, facing walls of hostility to being listened mm-hmm. to with respect, you know, over the last mm-hmm. few years. And that change has been fairly gradual. But um, so I know there's been a change because of the way that, you know, sort of policymakers and people are now listening to me whereas previously you know I was I was so clearly seen as a bigot I mean it was just you can you can just feel the hostility um but yet to this extent to be given an honor by the queen I that does indicate a huge huge change um and, and 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 I think the most important thing to me is how it vindicates all the parents who contacted Transgender Trend out of desperation because they were seen as bigots for questioning, for wanting, you know, for, for um, wanting evidence, wanting to support, you know, what in what was in the best interests of their children, that you know, that safeguarding their children, the welfare of the children. You know, it was um, Parents that we would see as the best parents in any other area were seen as bigots and had nowhere to go, and and so and and, and you know parents will go into schools and they will give them the transgender train schools guidance and the school will say well Stonewall have told us that this is a hate group, and then you've got to say oh no they're not then now all you need to say well is is well their founder has been. Um, uh, given an honour by the Queen for services to children, and that's uh-huh. all you need to say. <laughs> I think you know what a gift. I think you know mm-hmm. it's fantastic. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, it's beautiful. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I, I, I do feel like it's a recognition that all of the work I've done over, over, these, over the years with Transgender Trend, before that, with communicating with kids has been always, always for the welfare of children. Always. There's nowhere else that comes, this work comes from. And that's been, um, you know, um, uh, recognised. So, you know, it's huge and I'm, you know, I'm so thrilled. It's it's so justified. It's it's so lovely. It was so lovely when I saw it happen. It was like, ah! It was just felt so right. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes something happens and you think, you know, God's in his heaven and all's right with the world. This is good and proper and the right thing is happening. It's it's lovely. How, how do you see gender pan out over the next 
five, ten years, do you, do you have any kind of instinct about what way it'll go? I, I think oh, there's various things. I think um, <sighs> the House of Cards is, is falling. I think here in the UK in particular with Hillary Cass's interim report, and I think what started with the Kira Bell Judicial Review and the evidence that came out there, which introduced the world, I think, to the word detransitioner and, and, and you know, and to the, I, you know, the idea that people regret this, this pathway. Um, the repercussions worldwide, I think, have been huge, um, including in the States with the, the established, you know, gender affirmative surgeons like Marcy Bowers speaking out. I think that's, that's massive. Um, but the CAS review, which was an NHS commissioned independent review of the Tavistock, uh, produced its interim report. And really, um, you know, I read through that. I've read through it so many times. And that, again, is, is sort of vindication of what I've been saying uh, since 2015. Uh, and it's all in there. Uh, we're waiting for the final uh, report. But... Um, um, so the, the you know the Secretary of State for Health is 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 reading that and the um, Minister for Education, you know politicians are taking that serious. And whenever there's an independent um, uh, you know um, uh, research analysis of all studies or, or it always comes down to this side. It's you know it's what hap- what's happening in Sweden and Finland and France and Florida. Whenever there's a, a Independent, independent research, then it's like, will we stop puberty blockers? <laughs> the evidence isn't there. And that's happened in the UK through the National Institute of Health and Care Research, or I think that's what they called NICE. They did two, two reports on puberty blockers across sex hormones. Professor Carl Hennigan, who's the Professor of Evidence-Based Medicine at Oxford, did his um analysis the review of all studies and came out with the conclusion that it's not safe practice for children so whenever there's you know not anybody from either side of the debate when it's independent it always comes down and this is what politicians have to listen to um people who are truly um impartial in assessing the evidence so that's what we have from the from Hillary Cass's um, interim report. So I think there's going to be huge changes um, in the clinical um, pathway. In education, I also think there are going to be changes in schools um, and that that's happening now. As far as children are concerned themselves, as I said, I think there's a, there's a split in children, you know, in, in certainly in adolescence, that... Um, there are children who are sort of fiercely, you know, it's a social justice issue, trans rights, and and, the, um, and then there are other children who who think it's a load of nonsense and they're sick of hearing about gender. What I do think is that um, because it's been sold to young people as a youth movement, and it isn't a youth movement, it comes from the ivory towers of academia, and um, you know, it's a it's 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 a sort of what should remained an obscure theory um and it's you know it's come from adults um but but adolescents have i think taken it on and been flattered that they they are progressive and they're ahead of us and the older generation just don't understand about gender and they do but as it's being pushed so much in schools and being taught to them, at some point you have to think, what other youth rebellion has been led by teachers and parents uh, who are insisting that you believe in it and that you, you're not allowed not to? You know, you're, you're a bigot if you don't believe in gender identity. So, And there are punishments, and we're hearing a lot about how children are punished in schools for misgendering somebody or, or, you know, not following those rules. So what, you know, at some point, young people are going to think, wait a minute, this is, this is not a rebellion. This is something that is being forced on us by our teachers. <laughs> and, it will, and, and it will pass. But there's, been, there's a lot of collateral damage that's, you know, that's happened already. Um, and how long that will take, I don't know. But one thing that really worries me is... This has been going on. Um, I, I, I think it's really 
over the past five years. Before that, there were it was going into schools, but I think it's really quite sort of exploded over the last five years. And we have a generation who have been lied to, who have been brought, who have been, you know, school has been a culture of secrecy and lies and deception where children have been gaslighted. Girls in particular um, have, you know, the school has allowed their boundaries to be violated um, without their consent. And then they've been gaslighted with this, you, you, you know, they know he's a male classmate and they know he's a girl, she's a girl. Um, and the, the psychological damage from that, I, I really can't imagine because these are sort of coercive control techniques used in abusive relationships. Um, and school has become a culture, I mean, it's just, I would say a culture of fear, but I think it, it has. And we, you know, we, you know, we published a story about a, a girl who was bullied out of her school. And the bullying culture that we know is happening mostly to women online, you know, that women are really scared of losing their livelihoods if they speak out, um, uh, the way that, you know, you know um, people like you know, J.K. Rowling, for example, what's happened to her. We know that there is a bullying and silencing culture going on in the adult world. It's also going on in schools. And whereas we, I think it's causing great psychological harms to women who are not woke because we're no longer allowed to define ourselves and um, as, a, as a biological embodied reality, um, uh, we're, bigot, we're bigots if we do. Um, but at least we can um, talk about it, analyse it, do things. Because I, I always think with this work that I do, when I get really stressed or think, you know, gosh, it's, you know, why did I ever take this on? It's massive. I think if I wasn't doing <laughs> anything, I'd feel worse. Because, I would, you know, I would see it. Uh, and then if I wasn't actually doing something about it, I would feel much worse. So at least as adults, we can do that. Um, but for children, um, it's very hard and it's particularly hard because I've experienced being ostracised from my group once I started writing about this. And it was horrible, really upsetting. Not very upset about it for quite a while. And I thought then, you know, how can a teenager or a young woman say anything and risk being ostracised from her peer group when that is the world to her? I think it's really, really, really hard. But, uh, yeah, the sort of psychological, um, you know, um, mind, am I allowed to swear here? The sort of head fuck. Yeah, <laughs> you're an OPU. Uh, 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 okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a BEM, Stella. <laughs> um, oh, BEM, sorry, sorry. I'm Irish, I don't understand this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think it is a social experiment on this generation of children. Uh, it's absolutely unprecedented what we've done to this generation of children. And I think it's unforgivable. Yeah. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think it feels hopeful to me that there are more adults who are starting to kind of take their proper place in helping ground kids in reality. And I do think this has been a a disastrous experiment but thanks to people like yourself I think more uh, individuals who are seeing what's going on are able to speak about it and I do think the tide is turning and I would have to say not in a small part thanks to your work so we're so grateful to have had you on Stephanie and we are looking forward to seeing um if your predictions pan out as you <laughs> as you guessed they would and we maybe we'll have you back on when we can reflect back about how these changes are unfolding that would be great wouldn't it Lovely. look back on it yeah yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks thank you for me on. thank you for the amazing work that you're doing thank you just brilliant Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. This podcast is sponsored by Rhyme and Genspect, and listener support means a lot to us. The best way to help is to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Follow us on social media, and if you'd like to become a patron, you'll have access to weekly transcripts of the show, special Q&As, and you can join our listener community. 
Just go to our link tree. That's linktr.ee slash widerlenspod. Our discussions are for educational purposes only and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services. 